welcome to the Book of Mormon Evidence podcast with host Rod Meldrum. This week's Come Follow Me supplemental study is Lesson 31, Alma 43 through 52. Stand fast in the faith of Christ. Part 1 of two parts. This is a special double podcast with Darren Southam, who is Rod's guest today. Darren is a writer and director of over 30 commercials and short films, including the third all-time highest funded short film on Kickstarter in 2017 called Reign of Judges, Title of Liberty Concept Short. Most people know him as the mountain man scout Ephraim Hanks in Ephraim's Rescue, where he showed his ability to carry a film. Darren was born in Vernal, Utah. Most of his childhood and adolescence of 12 years was spent in Vancouver, Washington. A week after Darren's 17th birthday, his father died of a heart attack. As the youngest and last of five children in the home, Darren became the man of the house. The school stage is where Darren's passion for acting began, but he was also very much into sports and has played parts in that. He graduated from the University of Utah and also played college football at BYU-Idaho. His football days led to his first acting role in the Disney film, Going to the Mat. The following year, Darren booked another role in Disney's Halloween Town High, where he worked with Academy Award-nominated Debbie Reynolds. In spite of his brewing film success with a young family, Darren relocated to California to pursue a law degree. Shortly after moving, he booked a role in 127 Hours, where he worked with Golden Globe winner and Academy Award-nominated James Franco. Later, Darren was also direct cast as a younger character version of PT Emmy-nominated John Hurd in Counting for Thunder. Not letting his law background go to waste, Darren followed by landing a supporting role as the lead defense attorney in Just Let Go, where he worked opposite Emmy-nominated Henry Ian Cusack and Sam Sorbo Jenkins. Most recently, Southam worked in Yellowstone. Welcome, Darren Southam. Hi, everybody. Hey, this is Rod Meldrum. I'm glad that you're joining us again for another wonderful episode of the Come Follow Me uh, podcast series. And uh, I'm excited about uh, our, our guest today. Uh, we have uh, Darren Southam with us, and, uh, and if you don't know who Darren Southam is, I'm going to have him introduce himself a little bit more in just a second. Just so you know where we're at, we're basically, this is uh, Alma chapters 43 through 52. We're actually going to go only through about verse, through... Um, well, 50, 50 if we get there. <laughs> if right? we can get there. There's so much in these chapters, folks, and it's just, uh, it's just an amazing thing. This is the beginning of what uh, is kind of known as the war chapters of the Book of Mormon. And uh, and so I really would like to uh, to start off here with a with with Darren just to, to tell us a little bit more. Um, we've we've known each other for a number of years now, and we've had some opportunities to uh, to have you come and, and, and share some of your information and research. But uh, Darren is an actor, and uh, and and also he's become now a, a playwright, basically, or a, or a, or a, a, a script writer, yeah, exactly. and uh, so forth. And there's others, but I'm going to have you go ahead and just tell us a little bit about yourself, and also, if you wouldn't mind, a little about you, about uh, why you're so passionate about the Book of Mormon. I was raised, uh, I guess, LDS, uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, say it properly <laughs> and stuff. Uh, I was uh, raised in church, and um, I didn't really. You know, like most teenagers, didn't really take it seriously until I was uh, about junior year of high school, and uh, and it was it was kind of I think providential because I started taking life uh, a little more you know by the horns. Even at that age, it was kind of odd. I had a spiritual awakening, uh -huh. and a year later, my father passed away, and it was like oh, wow. that prepared me because had I not done that I think I would have handled that much differently you know a week after my 17th birthday and I was the last of five kids so I kind of I kind of uh, inadvertently came the man of the house all of a sudden how old were you at the I, I was a week after my 17th birthday oh, that's, right, so. that's right so you're just not, so, not very old yeah so that kind of that, that kind of changed things for me and, and and I took the other path I mean some people kind of take the I'm angry at God and life path, and I took the, you know, I'm not saying like a great person or anything, I just, I think, thank God I, I took the God <laughs> path, because yeah. it set me on a, a mission, and, and I, I really started uh, digesting the Book of Mormon in a way that I never, um, you know, you know, I, I would talk to people who had read it many, many times, and they're like, how did you... I'd only read it once, but it's just, it's it's how you read it, right? You really take you, it in. You really whether assimilated the, it. Yeah, whether yeah. it's the Bible or the Book of Mormon, you know, whatever, the Word of God, and you're taking it in, you you really, and I and I, and I I feasted on it. I just, I loved it. I reveled in it, and 
and and from a very early age, I, I started collecting movie soundtracks. I, live, I grew up in Washington, so it rained like <laughs> nine months out of the year, and the only thing to do was to go bowling at a at a at a non-smoke-free bowling alley where you came home, you know, literally smelling like a. Yeah. a like complete, like, you, like you have to burn your clothes when you. In fact, they're probably burning when you left. Uh, or you go to the movies, and so I, I went to the movies, and I, I, I developed an affinity for movie soundtracks, and that just, I mean, I, I felt like I was constantly in a movie because I'm listening to movie soundtracks. <laughs> and then um, when I was reading the Book of Mormon, it just the images just burst into my mind like visuals. And, and that, that got me started on, that's, that's what made me fall in love with the Book of Mormon, because it actually is a very visual book. If you read it, I mean, they're talking about, yes. I mean, arms being locked off, and you're like, oh, they're not leaving out any details. <laughs> and, and you're like, why is that in there, you know? And so you have to start asking these yeah. questions. It's the word of God, you know, at least, you know, 16 million people in the world think so, uh, and, uh, and we believe it to be so. Uh, but, you know, why is that in there? And that, that's what started me on this mission, and, and then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm married and four kids now, and uh, I uh, just felt wrought upon uh, back in 2014 to start a movement for a Book of Mormon film. And, you know, it's not like someone was standing up saying, hey, I've got $50 million for you to make a Book of Mormon <laughs> film. Is somebody, I'm like, somebody's got to do something. So I just started a, a, a crowdfund movement. We've done three Kickstarters. Uh, we've raised, uh, I think, over a half million on Kickstarter alone between the three. And uh, we we're, we're very close to our first million in, in the bank for, for production funds for our full feature. So we've created a, a pilot short that's 14 minutes that we've, we've used to kind of generate excitement and show people our vision. And um, they're, they're going to show you a, a quick trailer of that. But that, well, that's well, a little bit about a little me. Bit more about, tell us a little bit more about your acting experience. Oh, yeah, because, sorry. Because I, I, I got I to say, um, of all of the different actors that I have seen over my lifetime. And you've seen a few. A lot. Cause I'm old. <laughs> uh, I know this is going to sound a little bit uh, kind of weird. Don't get corny on me. But uh, the, the bottom line is, is that I think that you make the best Christ. Oh, wow. Actor. Wow. You've, 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 you've portrayed Christ in several of the different uh, films that the church has made. Yeah. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah. How, and how it would be. I can't even imagine how it would be to actually have to portray Christ. Horrifying. I mean, yes. Would be a word. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, no. But, uh, and, and there's a lot of really good Christ actors, but um, I don't know, for some reason, I just, when I, when I picture Christ, I, you are the closest to that, that as, as far as I'm concerned. Thank just, you. Just saying. You know, Thank you. And that's, uh, yeah, and I appreciate it. And I've, I've, I've been in, gosh, I don't know, the 30 plus films. Um, many of them I've starred in, and, and, and I've played, played Christ a few times, and I have to amend the horrifying comment, but obviously what I meant by that was <laughs> to portray someone like that. It's, uh, I know friends of mine in the acting business, um, and I wouldn't say their names, you'd know who they are, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they've told me I, I will not portray him, and it is because they just, they can't, they just can't go, they just... Can't get there, yeah. You know, and, and, and it's like, I had I was faced with the same choice and and I, you know I could have s taken the same path and I right. said you know what uh, we're in an imperfect world and you know uh, there's been nothing but imperfect people here except for the very Christ yeah. and so uh, I took it I took the opposite of I'm not going to get in the way at least that was my intent somebody in taking needs that role to do it. yes somebody has to do it and and, and 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 if you can just get out of the way and, and yeah. stop thinking of yourself as oh i'm i'm so imperfect i'm so yes we are but you know what like god knew that's the world we were going to live in and it, it, that's why he's there and if you just kind of get forgiving. out of the way yeah <laughs> i took the mercy road and said you know what he knows i'm imperfect yeah. and i'm going to try to get out of the way and just let let him it work through me and yeah. and i and yeah that, that was that was the way i took that so uh, another like another one that i one of my personal favorites is the is the ephraim's you yeah, did. you can you can get that on Amazon Prime right now yeah. for free. That was kind of my first. Um, I guess it's semi kind of semi decent the... big film. I guess they could just call it. You know, for yeah. Uh, but it, it was it, it, that was a good film. It, yeah, I love that. Amazing, and you did a great job in that one too. Thank you. Well, we're excited about uh, what you've got coming up. So just, just tell us just a little bit more. So so basically, why Reign of Judges? You haven't mentioned the name of that. But uh, what is the deal with the reign of judges? Why that? Why why not third Nephi? I mean, so many people want to do third Nephi. Why 
not the the final chapters and so forth. You know, basically what the oh, Mount Camorra. Oh, yeah, good. What good, was good it question. that caused you to decide to do the Moroni um, era? <clears throat> well, um, in my st studies and uh, process of doing that, uh, I came across uh, some charts that broke down the Book of Mormon and where the focus was. See, I, I'm, I'm kind of guy, I'm kind of, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. You know? <laughs> if somebody's like made the wheel, I don't need yeah. to go make it again. Make it again yeah. And uh, see, Mormon abridged the book. And so I thought, hmm, he has literally thousands of records he's choosing from, you know, so, so what he puts in there, he's taken great care to be there. Yeah. And so I'm going, you break it down, you break down the, the Book of Mormon and the amount of, so the time that Mormon takes uh, to explain a year of the reign of judges, or basically a year of the Nephites' time. Yeah. And in Alma, like it's, it's, it's you, you got some pretty good, you know, broken up, it's going pretty fast. And then in Alma, it's like just slow motion. It's like it's slow motion. Like, it takes him like 10 pages to get through one. We marched here, we marched there, we did He's this. He's giving this, this, all this of a sudden, all these details. Yeah. And it just happens to be the war chapters. And it, like one of the yeah. things that we're going to talk about today, I mean, we're going to get into this, but chapter 43 of Alma. And now we shall say no more concerning their preaching. And now I return to the account of the wars. Why is he telling us this? And, and so many have taken the opposite. Yeah. Like, well, I, I don't like those chapters. He's telling us this because these are the days that we're living in. We're living in a yeah. spiritual warfare never before seen on this earth. And so that's why that detail. And this is, there. is kind of unprecedented when it comes down to the scriptures, because although there's a there's, there's a few Old Testament wars where you know the Lord commands them to come right. and wipe somebody out or so forth. Yeah. There's very little detail. There's not really a lot there, and there's really not a lot of warring in the Old Testament. There's no warring really in the New Testament as far as that's concerned. Yeah. So this is kind of a, a unique thing as far as for scripture. Yes. So. Why the, the the war chapters? Basically, because it has to do with our sorry, day. Sorry, yeah, and I didn't I didn't quite finish that that yeah. thought, and that's I'm yeah. dumb. And sorry, you'll have to edit this because I'm <laughs> terrible. There's but, a lot uh, of stuff here. To it, talk but about. Mormon focused there, so not only did he slow down and give us detail, it, it, the the Book of Mormon's actually been broken down. Seventy three percent of the Book of Mormon deals with wars, secret combinations, political intrigue, strife, familial strife, contentions. Yeah. Like why? Why is so much of it, and yet, it mentions Christ almost four thousand times. Yeah, more even than even any the Bible's like, scripture. yeah, exactly. Even the Bible's, you know, most highest estimated count is like yeah. two thousand to twenty five hundred. It's yeah. so. Um, now to diminish the Bible, I'm just saying, when you yes, look at the yes. Book of Mormon from what it is, it's given us all this wars, and then it's talking about Jesus like yeah. more than any other book that we have on the earth. It's just it's this really interesting dynamic, and so that's. That's what made me focus on, that's what made me hone in on war chapters and more specifically Moroni, Captain Moroni. That's what made me hone in on him as a starting you're, film. you're taking a big chunk of the main focus of the Book of Mormon and actually yeah. dealing with it. Well, yeah, and yeah. when you think about it, think about it from a, film, a filmmaker perspective, because I know you do that all the time. No, from a filmmaking perspective, what do you want? You want an arc, archetype hero. Yeah. You want an archetype a villain. nemesis, a villain. <laughs> There, how could there be a better you know, Moroni is like the perfect archetype hero. His yeah. his story even follows. He's like this mighty man, and and so and and then of course you have Amalekiah, which is the archetype nemesis, and and it's and it's I mean it's the same stuff we're dealing with today, which we'll you know get into in these chapters, which are yeah, so exactly, fun. But exactly. Yeah. Well, one of the other things I just like to mention, and that is that in the Book of Mormon itself, Mormon basically said that uh, that Jesus Christ has shown you unto me, and I know you're doing, and then he basically tells us. If Mormon was yeah. shown our day, and then he, and then the Book of Mormon basically, as he was doing the uh, the abridgment of all of the records, I believe that he was actually taking portions from their history that would be apropos and and expedient for us to know in our day, uh, and even put it in a yeah. chronological order so that yeah. it actually matches up with the time frames of the Book of Mormon and that, the and the United States yeah. of America. Such a good point. And yeah. and when you see that this, these word chapters are what's leading up then to Basically, the coming of Christ. Right. It's all pointing to healing. Christ. Yeah, the healing coming of Christ. And uh, and so, um, if that's the case, then basically we are we may have been through some of these war chapters already, but they still are applying today. And we'll and we're going to point that out as we go through, you know, chapter forty three 
uh, you know, through 50 basically is what we're going to go through yeah. uh, here today. So yeah, you already mentioned. Uh, do you have, that's such a good point that he else? that he saw us. That's such a good point. Exactly. He he yeah. saw us. So he vision. deliberately so like, slowed it down so right. that we could get the detail, so that we could then know more understanding, have a greater understanding of what's happening in our day. And so I think that's the reason why the war chapters are such a big deal. Yep. And then of course the title "Reign of Judges" of the film. Reign of the Judges. And that's what we hear the whole time. I just took out the the. Reign, yeah, reign of, of Judges. judges. And yeah. it's, just, it's a great title for a, for a, a one film that could go into several films. It's yeah. a great uh, franchise title. Well, I tell you what, we're going to have you all be able to uh, to, to see the trailer yeah. of the film. It is phenomenal. If you have not seen the trailer, it's, it's fantastic. But if you really want to get uh, excited about this thing, you got you got to see the pilot. Yeah, the, um, pilot. the pilot is what 14 minutes 14 minutes, minutes and then there's a 10 minute behind the scenes which is a must see oh. that plays right after it when you buy and, it you get both and this this film yeah. is is unprecedented brothers and sisters because of the fact that just the kind of quality of actors that uh, were able to be you know to, to be had that Darren was able to uh, you know basically had to convince them to come and be a part of a, a film that is about the book of mormon and you couldn't you couldn't exactly hide the fact. I mean, it was clearly up front. Well, this we, is what was going well, on. Well, and that's a good point, Rob, because we we made that a very um, you know strong choice from the, from the beginning, and that is that. I mean, why why run from the fact that it's from? I mean, the Book of Mormon's amazing. Yeah, it's it's one of the greatest books on the earth, and it's the fourth most influential book in America. Uh, I mean, Joseph Smith was a, a, the Smithsonian rated him the, the the most influential religious figure in, in American history. Yeah. Like, I mean, uh, there's nothing to run from. Uh, it's a great and amazing book, and so we took that course. So we, you know, we didn't hide it, and and we had we had those discussions early on, right away with with the actors, and and they're they're like, well, you know, I haven't read the book, and and so and we had and they're this. not. Members of the yeah, church. Yeah, yeah. Ninety percent of our cast and crew about some, some really were not members people. of the church. And, and yeah. when, when we show the the, uh, the trailer of this, you're going to see who we're talking about here. But these these yeah. are well known people. Don't want to tell them just yet. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> we're, 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 we'll, we'll let you kind of guess on who's that who that is. But uh, but basically, so uh, let's let's do um, a little bit of a dive into the into the text here that we're that we're talking about here and give us some context. Then when we get down to the Captain Moroni. Part of it, which is just going to be in just a few minutes, yeah. then then we can jump right into the uh, the trailer, and then we want to talk about some of the characteristics of the man that became known as Captain Moroni, and uh, and he made basically others who are in the book of Mormon said that the very powers of hell would yeah. be shaken if if all men were likened to Moroni. So let's so that's what we want to talk about is yeah, that, yeah. that kind of character. So uh, so basically, again, we're using the annotated edition of the Book of Mormon here. Um, this is uh, basically, we're going to start on page 286, and this is uh, chapter 43 of Alma. Um, and, I'm and, using uh, my annotated laptop. Okay, your annotated laptop okay. version. Okay. Oh, do you have that already? Shh, don't tell anyone. They, nobody, okay. <laughs> anyway, so, I love this. In the, in the very first verse, it says that also Alma also himself could not rest. Now, this is yeah. Alma. He's getting a little bit older at this point in time. But uh, but this guy was on fire. I mean, he he couldn't be stopped, and it kind of reminds me of the Energizer Bunny or something like that. You know, it's basically uh, this guy. He didn't want to go out to pasture. He he wanted to go out in a in a ball fighter. of flame. If he was you will, a, fighter. a fighter. Yeah. yeah. And 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 this is another thing we're going to be talking about is that these. First off, we got we we need to understand and remember, brother and sisters, that this whole thing is being abridged by a guy, who was a warrior. Mormon, a warrior prophet, both, and a warrior and yeah. prophet both. And Mormon was abridging all this, um, and then he continues with his abridgment. So Mormon, I think maybe this had, I, I kind of think to myself, maybe he had some influences why there's so much war chapter stuff, because yeah. he's viewing it from the viewpoint of a warrior. Yeah, and he's seeing what kind of things it is that makes up a good warrior, and why warriors are actually important in a civilization. I think is another. Thing that we can learn from this that is that is not your typical average you know Sunday school kind of uh, well and thing. and and there's actually a you know there's, there's a really good arg article in the, I think it's the Liahona I've got it it's it's talking about um, you know why they had the war chapters right and it's they teach us like how uh, mighty virtuous men 
and women lived in such a horrific time. And that's that kind of a lesson of like, how do you like live in that sort of a yeah. just a horrible time? terrible time and, and they, so we see these heroes living in that time and and how they were able to still maintain their dignity and their honor in that time and, and also literally you know, steer their people in a direction away from utter destruction which they came up on the brink of several times right. in these in these in these chapters i mean it, it was it was nip and tuck alma is really engaged but then he says and now i mormon returned to the account of the wars between the nephites and the lamanites and he talks about the zoramites now that the Zoramites were obviously the descendants of Zoram, basically, right? And uh, and they then became they were dissenters, um, dissenters from the Nephites. Yeah, they had. and uh, and and they basically became Lamanites. So yeah. now there's they another did. another yeah. group. So we have, you know, um, Alma's well, King Noah's and his priests and so forth that they went over to the Lamanite side. <clears throat> and you have others who who are, who are being talked about here: the Amalekites, mm -hmm. the Zoramites. And so forth, and they've all now, but they, they became Lamanites. It says, and they gathered together their armies in the land of Jershon, and uh, and now we had uh, four weeks of uh, of of, um, of podcasts on the geography aspects of the Book of okay. Mormon. Yeah. So you can go back and kind of re refer to those with Ryan Nelson, and so forth. But um, but the, the, this uh, this land of Jershon area, basically, we're going to be talking about the Zoramite War here on page 293 of the annotated edition of the Book of Mormon right here. It has a proposed uh, geography of these wars. And so you can kind of see here, uh, from 1 through 7, um, you can actually get an idea of what this may have been, looked like from a geography standpoint. And it makes a, really a lot more sense when you see it from the geography standpoint. So they make uh, preparations for um, for war. Um, the land of Ant Ant Antionum was the land of the Zoramites, and there's a guy by the name of Zarahemna. <laughs> Zarahemna was their leader. I'm not going to say Zoram because Zoram was their <laughs> yeah. guy that kind of yeah. Yeah. united with them. But, yeah. yeah, he did. Yeah, but th this is uh, then verse. Um, let's see, six. He says Zarahemna appointed chief captains over the Lamanites. And they were all Amalekites and Zoramites. Now, Zarahemla was the, was the leader of who? The he Lamanites. was the leader of the Lamanites who united with the Zoramites. Right, that's right. right. And then the Amalekites and Zoramites were Nephite descenders. Right. Interesting. So interesting. Why yeah. would he choose these outsiders to come and be the captains over his main army? That doesn't seem to make any sense. Wouldn't uh, you want to have people perfect who are, sense. It makes perfect sense because uh, in any type of movement, yeah. you know, good or bad that you're kind of heading, you want to get somebody who's a dissenter from the group that you hate because yeah. they're going to drive the most hate, right? They're going to, because yeah. hey, I used to be one of them. Emotional, they're most, most yeah. uh, you know, convincing. Convinced to this. Because I used to be one of them. Yeah. 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 So it makes perfect sense to me. Where are you at, man? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was sending you out there. <laughs> anyway, so the Amalekites and Zoramites were the uh, they were the chief captains over the Lamanites, and it says that they uh, and, and the reason why because so they could stir up the Lamanites to anger against the Nephites, and this he did that he might usurp great power over them, and also that he might gain power over the Nephites. So if we get this right, so basically you have Zarahemna, he's using outsiders to stir up his own people. So that he can get power over who? Over his own. People. Over his own people. Yeah. What? He's the king. He so doesn't what, already so what have. Do we, what do we learn there? He doesn't already have power over yeah. his own people. Apparently, they weren't very motivated <laughs> by him being the king. So putting these other people in kind of seemed to motivate them more, and then and then they he 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 would get greater power over them. Yeah, and I and I read that that uh, you know when when you become really angry you're able to be used for not good purposes very easily yeah. and uh, so that's the first thing is you want to get them very angry once he got their anger riled up he could control them yeah. and then he could use them to then control yeah the nephites so that brings me to a question is anger good or is it bad and i think it can be either I think generally anger, Most though, is something is that uh, because because there's righteous anger, righteous indignation, righteous indignation yeah. which is kind of an anger, and in the, and in the Book of Mormon itself, it says that Moroni was angry. Yes, 
And yet he was this guy with this amazing character. And I, and I feel like from a, just a small footnote, from a character perspective, um, that at least in, in our script is, you know, every character's got to have a flaw. That's, yeah. Yeah, he's, could be. he's just, yeah. he's very passionate and, and yeah, he's, he gets angry yeah. about stuff. I, I think the idea that nobody gets angry I wonder. Did, I mean, did Christ ever get angry? We don't know if he was angry. We don't. We don't have any yeah. real understanding of his emotional state at the time when he cleansed the temple. But clearly, he was clearing, cleansing the temple because he he realized that it was being used for purposes that were outside of its, you know, what it, its its main you know, reason for having the temple yeah. there. Yeah. And uh, so, so bottom line is, is that. But uh, I've had, I've heard, and I've read different commentaries that he didn't do it in anger. He took time. He had to braid a, you know, a, a whip or whatever it was that he was using to, to mm -hmm. do that. He didn't just go in in a mad rage, but yet there's a certain there's got to be a certain amount of anger associated with when you see things of God being desecrated. That somehow that that arises in your in your soul, this this feeling that uh, this is wrong, and uh, this has to be. I kind of, stopped. Yeah, I kind of look at. I think you know when God <clears throat> sees that kind of stuff. I, I I imagine him in my mind, hurt. Yeah. More than uh, you know. Uh, you know necessarily, I'm gonna come squash you like an ant because you just you know <laughs> ruined my <laughs> statue of me or so. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, I I I find I I feel, I just imagine him just being hurt because he yeah. loves us so much yeah. to see. I mean, I'm just on it. You know, Imagine God seeing all the good and all the horrific evil that yeah. that, that goes on in the world. He, he sees it all, and to yeah. to be in that position, constantly seeing that, you know, uh, you got to be yeah. some a merciful being. Yeah, but the, even in the scriptures, though, it does it does have a talk about you know basically God was angry. It does. <laughs> <You know>? It does. <laughs> that God, you know, is uh, was it. Uh, it just had, it was just in my mind just a second ago, and but uh, basically, you know that that even he, you know, first off he can't look upon sin with any the least degree of allowance, yeah. but 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 he actually in, in some instances says in in my anger, yeah. you know, I, I will I will send forth the the torrent or the you know the the tempest or whatever. I think uh, maybe it's uh, the quick to anger that we definitely want to avoid. <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to justify cause he, anger. Because <laughs> he takes, you know, I, I mean, yeah. yeah. Because it does say that, of course. And, yeah. and, and uh, I mean, obviously, I just, I just don't see, I don't see God even when he's destroying people because he does destroy people who he gives time and time and time and time and time again, yeah. Yeah. time to repent and change and to yeah. be good people. Yeah. And that when they don't, it, it, we have records of many civilizations being destroyed. The Nephites yeah. being one of them. Yeah. And I, but I don't. I just don't see him coming in and I'm having so much fun killing him. I just, no. you know. But yeah, I'm, and, and I'm fact, sure he's angry. I, and I think that that characteristic of God is actually a, a characteristic that is shown here in these chapters with Moroni, because yeah. he doesn't want to kill people. That's right. It makes it clear, even though he's the captain of the armies and he's really good at killing people, apparently. Yeah. Uh, the bottom line is, is that uh, he he doesn't enjoy it. He doesn't want to. Yeah. I think part of part of our problem with the killing of people and people dying is that we have a tendency to think of that as being the end of things. And with God, it's just the next phase. So yeah. it's not it's not like it's like the end. What so so many people in the world feel like that you know when you die it's over and that's it. You know, with God, He understands that this is just the next phase. They're just okay, next level. <laughs> you know. Well, and I, I, and I like. So it's not as traumatic of a thing from the viewpoint of God. I don't think. Yeah, sure, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I like. I, I was thinking of the the scripture in one of these chapters. I'm neglecting which one, but where they said that they were sorry to take up arms against yeah. their brethren. You know, they just they hated that they had to do it, but but they also said, but they weren't going to let their wives be massacred in the most brutal ways, you know, possible. Yeah. They weren't going to yeah. allow that to happen. Yeah. And then um, th it said too in the following verse that um, they uh, were sorry to send so many of their Brothers. of their family to the next life unprepared yeah. to meet God. And I mean, that would be the hard thing, is you know that. I think so the doing. hard part was the unprepared to meet God part because if they right. were ready, if they right. if they were righteous and people and they had died, just just like the anti Nephi exactly. you know, basically, yeah, totally. You different. know, if they they were basically ready to see their maker, they were ready to go to the other side, 
and had they died, it's like hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> you well, know, it's game over. Exactly. You know, yeah. this, this is great. So anyway, so uh, back to this. But so I just find it interesting. So you have basically the king of the Nephites were using, the king of the Lamanites were using right. former Nephites to get more power over his own people. But what was the reason why he wanted to get more people over his own, more power over his own people? Because he literally, his ultimate goal was to take down the Nephites. Right. To establish a and kingdom. And he knew he, he had to basically yeah. have complete uh, um, control of, the, of, of, the, of his entire people if he's ever had a hope of taking down the entire Nephite civilization. Right. And that's what it basically writes, it says. So, But the Nephites, now they had a completely different thing. Instead of power and glory and sub subjugating the, their their subjects, the Nephites, what was their motivation? This is what, and, they, and it says this probably about six or seven different times. It, it goes through this this kind of litany of uh, this list of, of, uh, of things that the Nephites were doing. They wanted to, A, support their lands and their houses and their wives and their children. This is in verse 9 of uh, chapter 43. <clears throat> and they might preserve them from the hands of their enemies, and also they might preserve their rights and their privileges. Now, if we, if we take a look, and I mean, I, I can understand why a man would want to, to, uh, to, to basically support his, his wife and his children, and even his house and his lands, but supporting their rights. I mean, don't people just kind of have rights? Why do you have to basically assert your rights? Well, if, uh, I think we're, we're seeing uh, in America right now even just if yeah. you don't assert your rights, uh, they're going to be taken away. Because there are other people who will assert who, your rights who will if you take won't. Them away, yeah. yeah, and 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 then there's a lot of people who don't even understand where our rights even come from. Yeah, but exactly. They didn't, a lot of people really believe that our rights come from our government. Exactly. That yeah. our government bestows when we can do things, when we can uh, go places, where we can go, how far we can go, um, and all those kinds of things. And um, Or how far we can stand and, apart. And, and they have our best interest at heart, right? Yeah. yeah. Or how far we can stand apart, <laughs> exactly. Or how long we can stay shuttered in our homes. Yeah. Uh, or any of those kinds of things. You know? So basically the government can tell us those things. Now, the, uh, the, the reason why... Uh, in the, here in the United States, I mean, we we vote for and we put people into positions of leadership because we respect their ability to be to be able to guide and to lead. represent. Yeah. But ultimately, who are they guiding, leading for? It's we, the people. Right. And we have this tendency to feel like that because we've given them some authority, that they can use that authority to basically trample on our rights. Right. And that is. A common misconception because people think when they get a little authority, they don't realize where the authority comes from. Their authority comes from we the people in the United States right. of America under the Constitution that was inspired by God. And, and this is very similar. To the Nephites were in a republic too. It was in a representative, that's right, judge republic. It, it was uh, so they they and had the, the same judges. the same thing. They had you know elected ch judges. Yep. Who who would then uh, you know said that Moroni was appointed by the judges and by the voice of the people? That sounds like a republic to me. <laughs> That's right. So I mean That's they're going right. the same things, and and I think right here it's it, we learned that if you don't assert your rights, your yeah. God-given rights that government doesn't give you, you have them. You and if you don't because you are a child of God. Well, yeah. The the phrase wherewith God hath made us free, yeah. God makes has made made us free, and if if we don't assert that freedom and, and, and one, understand what it is mm -hmm. and, and assert that constantly, it will be taken. I mean, history history is replete with examples that, yes. of uh, evil people yeah. who, I, I, for the life of me, I, just, I don't understand that kind of mentality, but yeah. there's people out there that want to oppress and take away your rights and, and yeah. all for power and you know, all the things they say. Right? Well, they want to subjugate people. And, and, and usually the main reason why peop some people want to subjugate other people is literally, if you boil it down to it, it comes down to laziness. They don't want to have to work yep. and, for and their this living. Is a, this is a really good point. This is a question. <laughs> like human nature. You ask anyone, in a, in, you know, what is human nature? Does, do humans long for freedom? 
they actually long to be taken care of more than they long for freedom. Freedom has to actually be earned. Yeah. Like, as far as, like, understanding what it is mm -hmm. and really valuing your freedom. And I think, uh, you know, right now in America, that's, it's, it's happening because I feel like people don't, they've never, not, in, not, not, not like now, they've never had their freedoms really tested. And they don't know what it is they're giving up so freely. But, and it's because they, they don't, I mean. Well, how long has it been since World War II? The, right. last time, the last time when we as a people had the possibility of living under a Hitler. Right. Well, you know, and, and how did he come to power? World you know? War II, yeah. <laughs> how did that happen? Yeah, but the world rose up and they put down this, uh, you know, the, the, the fascism, basically the Nazi you know, regime of Hitler. Uh, because they, because people knew what was going on with that, you know they were subjugating entire classes of people based on what they thought was their ancestry or or their particular religious viewpoints. Yeah. Once somebody comes into complete and ultimate power, it's intoxicating, and they just can't help but use that power yeah. to destroy anything that they feel like they should destroy, or to uh, uphold or uplift anything that they that they particularly like. Well, and whatever this, sin and this that is, might be, and, and this is right again in line because all the all the people that were trying to take away the rights and the privileges to worship God, religious freedom, right? I mean, yeah. all the all the yeah. evil uh, people in the Book of Mormon that were trying to take that from the Nephites, they were the same. What did they want? They wanted to subjugate and then plunder, and and steal and and live off of them like that. Yeah. They wanted to make them slaves, make them do the work, and they would just eat. That's literally what they did. And it's no different yeah. today. Like ultimately, when you think of you know the paths of, you know, say communism versus Americanism, and that's where it leads ultimately is yeah. people yeah. working for free and and others just you know the living off of that. Well, we're we're seeing some things in that now. Um, hopefully, we, I mean, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We were actually recording this about uh, about what two months or so, yeah. approximately two months in advance of when this is going to be uh, released. So. We don't have the advantage of knowing what's going to be happening the begin the first week in August when when this comes out, but right now in the middle of, or the, the the beginning part of June, um, there are things going on in our nation that are just absolutely unprecedented. Yeah. With actual uh, cities, uh, large cities in the United States being literally taken over by by terrorists in. in terrorist organizations within the United States and in many cases and, and claiming yeah. and proclaiming this this area is their own and not part of the United States and kicking out all the police officers and that kind of stuff um, it kind of reminds me of you know here we have the Lamanites who were basically they were pretty decent overall people I mean they kind of minded their own business they just live were living their lives not a big deal and they but they do have a king and he's and but he apparently doesn't have a lot of power but then they bring in these outsiders to stir them up and to get these people who are otherwise pretty much peaceful, at least at this point in time, they were, it actually talks about them. They, they, did, they didn't want to fight and so forth. And, they, um, and so they come in, they stir them all up um, so that they can get now it's important power. To note, yeah, it's important to note that the outsiders, their intent is actually to subjugate their own people, the Nephites, and they're actually... In, in the worst way possible, yeah. using the Lamanites and their hatred, they're, it, they're using them to usurp their own republic, to overthrow yeah. their own government. That's, I mean, the, the dissenters that go over, that, that, that's what they're, they're trying to use those people yes. and their hate, hate yeah. their, their eternal hatred for who used to be their brothers um, yeah. to, you know, take over the government. Yeah, like so, you said, it's almost like the land, land mites are just kind of hanging out most of the time. They did come on the Nephites, you know, a few times, but yeah. usually it's at the behest of, you know, <laughs> they, it's always going to be. They get egged on yeah. by these other, uh, by, by these the, the, the dissenters, which is also reminds me a little bit about the, in church history, you know, the, uh, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the problems that Joseph Smith had wasn't because of just outsiders who said, oh, I, think, I think he's just kind of nuts. People that it was people who, leaders who were leaders within the early church yeah. who basically turned on the prophet Joseph Smith yep. and then basically caused a lot of these, uh, these issues, people who are internal to the, to the whole uh, restoration. And, and you, actually, you, you actually don't even have to 
like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or even, you know, think that it's true in at least a bit degree. You might even think it's a big hoax. But you, you have to you know, appreciate that happens. I mean, that any mm-hmm. any movement that's, yeah. you know, worthwhile and has meaning, there's always dissension. It happens, you know, and it yeah. happened to... Well, I, I don't want to get too too political. I yeah. think most of you probably know um, that, as far as me personally concerned, um, you know, in, in the United States we basically have kind of a two party system, Republican and Democrat system. But there's also this other third area called independent, and I consider oh, I myself you're say independent. The third area is Trump. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 he kind of took. There's over a third the, area. The one party. It's, it's called okay, Trump. Anyway, <laughs> but 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 basically. So when you when you consider though this this uh, the the fact that there's basically this two party system, and then and then I was just going to mention here that uh, when it comes down to um, this these 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 groups here they're talking about this in the Book of Mormon, I kind of look at for example we just had this big thing um, with the Black Lives Matter, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. and the Black Lives Matter people although that's not 100% clear. They, they, they're, they're, they at least they claim to be just peacefully wanting to protest for uh, resolution of, of laws and so forth that that will address basically uh, you know racism mm-hmm. and uh, so forth in the United States. Now the United States is unique in that we have races basically from all over the world, yeah. um, and, so, and it's a big melting pot. And we have to realize that you know the uh, the black population is thirteen about fourteen yep. percent of the total population, but every life matters. Yeah. And in fact, our leaders have even talked about that. You know, every every life matters. It doesn't matter whether you're Asian or Hispanic or black or white, or or whatever. Well, and, and every life matters. Just, just, I mean, not just yeah. black lives. I agree. But their their movement. They, they they say that they wanted to have a a, a, a peaceful protest. Well, let's throw that out. Cause but then don't. somebody somebody's come in and hijacked that. Yeah. And started doing the looting and the and the and the taking down of the cities and, and, and burning and the, the assaults, cities. The violence and, and that's the Antifa group. Yeah. So they're using the movement basically. Yeah. In a very kind of a similar way as what we're seeing here, you have the you know the Lamanites basically in this particular case. Let's say the the the, the black population. They want to have you know, the same rights as everybody else, and they should because you know, the bottom line is what the skin color you're born with, you can't change that. There's nothing you can do about that. It's just the way you are. It's, it's, there's nothing you can change about yeah, that no, genetically. You shouldn't want to change it. Right, it's right. Everyone's, and, and everyone's exactly. Different. There's no reason to change it. This is, yeah. this is who you are. When, when a person cannot change something about themselves, then I believe that the, that the situation is is that there should be no, you know, uh, discrimination against that, yeah, in any way, shape, or form. You know, things that are a choice, um, then yeah, then 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 that they have to make choices about certain things. But the bottom line is is when it comes down to to this, I think Antifa, which is kind of this this, well, President well, Trump a calls them a terrorist organization, a, a terrorist yeah. organization. They've tried to co-opt the otherwise peaceful black population basically who is is doing this um, you know and, and, and causing you know the black eye basically if you will of the, of the Black Lives Matter movement yeah. and uh, I see the same kind of thing these are dissenters most of the people in Antifa aren't black yeah they're outsiders That's interesting most of them are whites <laughs> and, and so they're they're going out and they're agitating the black population into into actually coming into basically conflict or war with the police so they can get power and if they can get the police to back down which now they have in, in at least places, one city yeah. okay then what we what we have basically is a situation where anarchy steps in That's right. and if they can get this to happen um, you know then then is it a possibility that they could actually change the national election coming up here in a couple of months you know, because of that. Well, I think that's part of what their goal is, is to obtain power over the rest of the population, the Nephites in this particular case. Well, in the and, and, there's a, and there's another, I think it's in later chapters with the Malachi, with the Freemen. And, uh, yeah, that's coming up. They sought to establish a kingdom unto themselves. <laughs> and when I think of, like, the people in Washington... Uh, what do you think they're doing? They, they're establishing a kingdom unto themselves. Seattle, yeah. yeah Seattle, actually, Washington, yeah. 
Yeah. And 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 and, uh, and like we were discussing earlier, it's it's not it's not going to be very long before a yeah. leader is going to jump up in that group and all of a sudden i mean what well somebody is already telling the the mayor of the city their demands yeah somebody somebody and the governor, who's in charge who's in charge. and the governor of the land is and the being told the this is what you will do you're going to get rid of all the police forces yeah and you're going to basically have new trials for every every person who's been incarcerated who is who is black you're we're going to have all these other things yeah. that are, that are that are specific to us and you will do these, or we're going to continue to basically uh, what's, burn your city. What's down. interesting, though, about that is, you know, they, they want to be interesting when we actually watch this and have seen the, the, the two months in between here. We may not recognize the United States by the time that comes. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I certainly hope not. But uh, <laughs> you know, they 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 want to retrial for for you know people that are black. But how many how many blacks lost their jobs? And like we we're talking about blacks because it's Black Lives Matter. But it's really yes. like you said, how many jobs were lost? But yeah. how many black li jobs were lost when you burned down Target? How many black cops have been how killed? How many black policemen have now been killed because and of this? Because yeah. of this. And I mean, isn't that the exact? I mean. Make that make sense, right? And how many it business owners make that are black exactly. have had their businesses burnt business to the ground? Burnt the, yeah, it just doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. It starts, yeah. to, it starts to be just ludicrous. And so, yeah. anyway, yeah, I think we've got to get back to common I, sense. I think that our, 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 um, the amount of, uh, of inter interaction between blacks and whites and, and Hispanics and all the other Asians and so forth is actually usually pretty darn amiable for yeah for the in yeah, general by and there's large, a, yeah. a few big cities that have major problems because of, the, of their, their leaders yeah they, just put their, they, they, they elect people who will not obey the law and so that happens anyway so we're kind of getting off on this <laughs> whole thing there hey you, you, but, you <laughs> uh, but anyway so so finishing up here uh one of the other things that they wanted to, to defend was their liberty and we've talked about liberty before, right? In the uh, in, in earlier podcast, we talked about the difference between freedom and liberty and how liberty is a conscientious choice to follow God's laws, whereas freedom is do whatever you want to. And uh, so liberty basically says that they want to follow God's laws and it follows up with that they might worship God according to their desires. These, these are people who really want to live righteously. They want to follow God. Verse 11. Says, Yea, and they also knew the extreme hatred of the Lamanites towards their brethren, who were the people of Anti Nephi Lehi, who were called the people of Ammon. So, this is another in, interesting in a aspect. Race perspective, we're the same race. We're, they're actually the same people, but they're, they're the same, the same race. people. And the same, well, and really the Nephites and Lamanites are really the same race, but they're differentiated because of their you know, skin color, apparently. Right. Okay. And uh, so, they, so here we have. The Lamanites hate these people who went over to the Nephite side. Who were their own people. Their own Literally people. Literally their own people. Yeah. And that kind of reminds me of, uh, of, of people who have been told, and again, not to get too, too political here, but we're going to have to get a little bit here for a second. The party that actually was the party of slavery from the South was who? The Democrat. The Democrat Party. And the party that was for you know for segregation and for prohibition and all this kind of stuff, that was always the Democrat Party, yep. and yet ninety something percent of blacks vote Democratic, even though they're the party that that began things like the the Ku Klux Klan and so forth. They're the ones that started all that. Um, now they said they said, well, we've repented now and we're, now we're changed around and so forth, right? But the bottom line is is that anybody who doesn't agree with Blacks should always vote Democratic, which is what uh, Joe Biden actually <laughs> said. If, you, if you're not, if if, if you're uh, if you're black, you have to vote for me, kind of thing. Then, bottom line is, is that people who don't vote for Democrats who are black are called Uncle Toms. They're they're called you know they're they're not being true to their to their race and their people. And uh, this is. Kind of sounds like the same kind of hatred that the Lamanites had towards these anti Nephi Lehi's who were who were actually their own people. Well, it's actually a, a tactic here that they they use that the you know, dissenters in the Book of Mormon are using yeah. collectivism. So they're so they're saying yeah. you as a black or a white you represent every white person ever born. And I'm like, I've never owned a slave. I don't even think ancestors in my background have owned slaves. So so why am I? Why am I supposed to have a collective guilt? Yeah. You know, I mean, sure, I mean, it's terrible, but yeah. you know, 
it, that it's it's taking out the individual and not and like no no you, name one example of, yeah. of me being racist t t give me one example yeah. and you can't because I'm not a racist person well it's, 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 it's the same really kind of ludicrous idea that because one cop does something really stupid and dumb exactly. and, 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 and should be punished to the full extent of the law and it was all right there on yes. video with George you know the bottom line is is that's absolutely un unexcusable and he will pay a price for that but to then label all police forces everywhere in the United States, what, 700,000 uh, people, I mean, 99.9 something percent of these police officers that are upholding the law are good, decent individuals. The vast majority have families. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they work in the community. They, they, you know, they, they live there. I mean, basically the bottom line is, is that, uh, you know, to try to then to create a a, a situation that takes the people who are the, the, the thin blue line <laughs> that that basically uh, the people that are called whenever there is a breakdown of civility in our in our society that we're going to somehow punish them because they have one or two bad apples it's like it's like saying that somebody in the NFL if they if they miss a pass if they drop a good pass it hits their hands and they drop it well we should we should get rid of the entire NFL because right. somebody screwed up, which is which is ludicrous, and there there is no industry anywhere in the United States where everybody's perfect. So you have to understand that things are going to happen like that. But you put rules and regulations, in, and you, you try to train the, the the police officer so that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. But you don't basically go saying that all cops are bad just because of that. Personal feeling there. Anyway. Oh, I, I, I'm. <laughs> Right this is this is this is a big deal here right at this moment in time here Hope, hopefully in a couple months I think it it's be. I think it's uh, you know it's it's really helpful to see the tactics they're using are the same yeah. tactics that were used in the Book of Mormon like again He's why did right Mormon there. choose this stuff because he saw what was going on and he said hmm I'm gonna show them this because this is actually exactly what happened with us and maybe they can learn something by seeing yeah. what happened to us I think he's saying they're gonna need this they're gonna need this but he's writing this stuff down. Okay, verse 13. The people of Ammon did give unto the Nephites a large portion of their substance to support their armies. So basically these are the anti-Nephite Lehi's, the former Lamanites who now are with the Nephites. They're going to actually, it's kind of almost like a tax, I would think. It's, they're going to give some of their substance to the Nephites. Well, to, I, think it's, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it a tax because yeah, a tax, really tax is an involuntary. That's just like a yeah. government saying yeah. give us money. They actually... They said give. They offered the money. Yeah because of their covenant to not take. Yeah. I think that's an important distinction because they, they weren't yeah. forced to do that. They, they, they said, you know, we'll give them our substance yeah. To, yeah. To, to do this because they want to honor their covenant. Well, I know you want to talk about this covenant stuff and we're going to get, jump into that here in a big way because this is, um, I, 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 as most of you know, I'm all about covenant stuff too. So we're going to have a great discussion here. But, um, this this idea of covenants was such a big deal back there. I mean, you can actually see the anti Nephi Lehi's because of the covenant that they made. They would rather die than break the covenant. And even the the Lamanites, as we're going to see here in a couple of these chapters, um, they basically said, you know, they were they were going to be forced to to make to take a covenant, and they refused to do so. And they were basically saying, you know, we're going to die rather than take this covenant that we know we're going to break. Right. So covenant making is a big, big deal for all of the people of the Book of Mormon, both on oath the Lamanite as well. and the Nephites. Oath, covenant oath. Yes. Yeah, and yep. and, and uh, the the one the one that uh, the one the one more was uh, when they were you know traveling to to the second city that was fortified by Moroni, and they uh, mm -hmm. this is later on in the chapters, but they they swore with an oath that they would attack that city. And this again, it just to the point, <laughs> it, you don't it, you can be a good guy or a bad guy. It, it yeah. establishes. How, how uh, what's the word, not sacred, but like how grave, what's the word I'm looking for, that a covenant was. It was It was like, oh, yeah. it was, you make a covenant, what, you bad guy, good guy, you make a covenant, was an oath, I mean, it, that, yes. was, that was your life. And so, yeah. and we learned that because even though it was fortified in the second city, it's like, well, we made the oath, so. We got to do it. We're going to go do it. Even if it costs us our lives. And then Amalekiah <laughs> does, does an oath to drink Moroni's blood, which of course was rash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, the, the, but this is interesting because it puts the Nephites in, in a kind of an odd position. 
Because here you have the Nephites, and here in uh, verse, verse 13 it says, The Nephites were compelled alone to withstand the Lamanites, which consisted of Laman and Lemuel, and also the sons of Ishmael, and all those who were descended from the Nephites, who were the Amalekites and the Zoramites, and also the descendants of priests of Noah. So we have all of these other people on the Lamanite side now, and just the Nephites are still over here. So that's why they outnumber them like two to one exactly at this two, point in time over two to one. so then that so then captain moroni now comes in the picture this is the first mention of captain moroni now in the book of mormon is verse 16. it says now the leader of the lame the nephites or the man who had been appointed to be the chief captain over the nephites was moroni now he was a, appointed to be chief captain over the over the nephites and moroni took all the command and the government of their wars and he was only 25, 25. years old when he was appointed chief captain over the armies of the Nephites, so uh, well, Darren's got some uh, some some interesting things to to, uh, to to share. Tell us a little bit about this uh, this chart here. Um, so, when in in you know when you're writing a film, um, and I would I would challenge anyone when you're reading uh, Holy Writ uh, um, to to picture it as a movie. When you do that, you're forced to find things in the scriptures how would it look like how would they act um you know uh, and, and you're, you're forced to visualize and see it and when you do uh you'll see all sorts of stuff and 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 it's it's no different with this you know moroni comes on the scene when he's 25. Uh, i created this uh poster size uh captain moroni character timeline uh, because as, as you can imagine you're reading the book of mormon the book of mormon jumps all over the place it goes back forth <laughs> inserts in time, yes. it's not in chronological order and so to keep it all together even just ammon going to the lamanites it, all of this happens during moroni's lifetime so i'm writing a film that you know captain moroni is the hero uh so I, I i created this timeline that shows you on the left the reign of judges year on the right is the uh, the BC year. That's left of the center there. Uh, yeah, left. Yeah, left of center's uh, reign of judges ROJ. On the right is BC, and then the middle number is Moroni's age. And then you have all these critical events that happen that are you know bullet point you know with bullet points and the year that they happened. And so once you start doing this, uh, I had to do this to keep it all you know in my head at a quick glance. And you go, okay, so here we are in this, you know, tw you know, he's 25 years old. And, uh, you know, what year, what year are we at? We're uh, 77 BC, essentially. Um, and so you kind of look at all the events that, that happened in there. And, and, and that, that really kind of guided, uh, even though, you know, before Moroni's mentioned, like he says, the first mention of Moroni, which again, is very interesting, like, he comes on the scene. This is the first mention yeah. of him. Where did he come from? Who's Where did his, he who's come his from? Parents? Who's his dad? Well, yeah, who is his dad? Yeah, what's his background? And we have this huge hole. But what mm. I found in, in, in writing, uh, we've written two scripts. The, the second one we wrote was more the origin story of Captain Moroni. And what I found is it, when you see the events that happened, you can start to formulate where Moroni would have may have been, you know, and, yeah. and you start to it's 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 not too challenging once you can see what is going on and you go oh how old was moroni then oh he was he was uh, you know in his late teens early 20s when ammonihah was burning the christians oh <laughs> and so you start to think what was moroni doing i bet you he was in the military yeah. I mean, he doesn't. Back in those days, probably military service started maybe 16, 17, yeah. 18 years old. When you got He'd to be fought in battle, basically sure. the size of a man, basically, you're probably. Well, yeah, Mormons appoint him when he's 15. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they, they obviously matured, I think, faster than we do today, especially yeah. the, you know, young, well, young and video games. Probably as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I mean. Well, yeah, but anyway, so. Yeah, so <laughs> moving on. Yeah, so, so bottom line is is that uh, what, you're, what you're saying, you're proposing is, is that maybe. You know, I mean, if it, by this time he's 25 years old. Now he's taken over complete, you know, uh, leadership of the of the yeah. Nephite army. So he's probably been a warrior for a few years, which right. means he's probably seen some action. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't make somebody who's never seen any action the leader. That's right. So and and, and we're living in a republic. Yes. So the leader doesn't just go, okay, I'm the leader now. It's yeah. not a dictatorship. They have to actually win the voice of the people. Yeah. So then you start to get an idea. I mean, you start to think gladiator, big audience. He, he must have done something that, you know. 
and and uh, and he had to have proven himself in war. He had clearly. to have proven himself. Yes. And then, like you know, we were discussing earlier that uh, you know who was the chief captain before Moroni, Zoram, and his sons. Well, at least you know the ones mentioned. I'm sure he had daughters too. You yeah. know, I wish the Book of Mormon had mentioned them. I, I think the Book of Mormon doesn't mention them out of us respect personally. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, you know, I agree. look what we do with the names we have. Yeah, you know, exactly. uh, but you know his two of his sons that were mentioned, Aha and Lehi, and of course you know we know Lehi very well. Um, mm -hmm. He's, you know, he he fought. It says the majority of their battles together, him and Moroni. He was a man like unto Moroni. Yeah. And so we learn when Moroni dies, and or sorry, when he retires. He, Le Lehi was Alma's son, right? No, Le Lehi is uh, Lehi is Zoram's son. He was the chief captain's okay, son. Okay, okay. Lehi and Aha. Okay. okay? Oh, yeah, that, that are right. mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And so then we have like, uh, you know, how is it that Moroni gets elected chief captain? Well, first of all, the, the chief captain that's living has to go away, and, and, and I mean that in, 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 with all respect. So, but he ha there has to be a vacancy. That, so and that, and so that could be a retirement, or he could have died. It could be a retirement, <laughs> but. We learned, I, I doubt that they retired people when they're 25 and 26 years old. So more than likely, he was probably killed. I would. I well, mean, think. That, that but, but then you deduce that when Moroni retires, because he had the retirement one. Yeah. Who does he give it to? <laughs> he gives it to Moroni, his son. So we learn there's a tradition here that he's handing the baton to his son. So then you ask the question: Why didn't Zoram hand the baton to his son Lehi? Well, he must have died. Yeah. And Lehi would have been in line. Why did it go to Moroni? Once again, pointing to Moroni had to have done something. Some great deed. Yeah. Absolutely just uh, other, otherworldly, supernatural on, mm -hmm. on, the, on the battlefield to have proven himself and, and the eyes of the entire nation turning on him. And so in my, in my, uh, in my script that I wrote, if you, you go down this chart right on, uh, it, it's, again, it's not hard. So, it, so if you if you look at 76, so he's elected in 77 BC. 76 BC would have been 24, so that's probably about the time he should have done something pretty cool, right? Yeah. Well, if you look to the left, uh, you got 76 BC in the yellow. Amlice, Amlicite and Lamanites who followed the people of Ammon stormed Jerishon in rage and quote a tremendous battle ensues, and it gives us this qualifier. Such an one as never had been known among all the people in the land since Lehi left Jerusalem. Tens of Biggest thousands. Battle ever. Huge, huge battle. And you're going, put the, put the dots together. Moroni is 24. <laughs> there's a huge sweeping battle. And it's over race. They're wanting to kill their own brothers. And who's protecting them? You know, the, the fair-skinned Lamanites or Nephites are protecting yeah. their, you know. And so you have this... You know, racial battle going on, yeah. and uh, and so he's 24 years old, <laughs> it, and it, it, a lot of people died. A lot of good people died in that battle, and and, and I just that's where Zoram dies. Yeah. So I mean, you'll have to watch the movie. I don't want to spoil it. That's, <laughs> I, I will say that that's not the you know that's not, not the, trailer, the climax of it. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but you, you start to put together these the story about where he came from. And what made him this man who was uh, so, so valiant for freedom yeah. and liberty and who loved his people and his country comes from somewhere. Yeah, but yeah. Exactly. Now in verse 18 of, uh, verse, of chapter 40, we're still in chapter 43, still, okay. In verse 18, it says, It came to pass that he met the Lamanites in the borders of Jerusalem, and his people were armed with swords and scimitars and weapons of war. Um, and Nephi had prepared, uh, uh, the people of Nephi, or that Moroni had prepared his people, with breastplates and arm shields and and uh, also shields to defend their heads. Mm -hmm. They were also dressed with thick clothing. This was apparently not something that was brand new because uh, as as um, you know the because here, here we have in this particular uh, battle that we're talking about here the Zoramite War. Um, the Lamanites were coming to battle in nothing but a loincloth. The Nephites were dressed to the nines with heavy you know. Uh, Cloth, basically, it talks about the thick clothing and also these 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 shields and so forth. But I, I find it interesting. In fact, I didn't I didn't really know this until we were just talking before we did the podcast here together. Um, but uh, did the Lamanites actually ever have armor prior to this time? And the answer is 
Yes. Yes, they did. Yeah, we. Yeah, and Mosiah, and, and Mosiah actually talks about, let me see, I wrote it down here. No, excuse me, in Alma chapter 3, verse 5, it talks about the, uh, the, the, the Lamanites and that they had, they gird their, gird their armor about their loins and so forth. So they had armor, but for some reason, they just decided to come to this particular battle in their nothings, <laughs> you know, in their, in their loincloths. Why do you think that would be? If they had armor, why didn't they wear it? Why didn't they come to come to battle ready for battle? I I'd, I'd go with I think they're found in their chest. Yeah, they pretty much. Yeah, I we totally agree. We just need this flesh. That's all we need. It's, it's kind of like when they were um, they were <laughs> eating the flesh of the uh, the fathers of the people at the well, very now end. You're, now you're skipping. And, 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 and they did that as a token of bravery. Yeah. I think that they were basically going. Yeah, we are. We're, we're going to get so worked up. That yeah. they don't even realize that, yeah, you know, it might be smart to put on some armor. Oh, I'm just going to leave my yeah. armor home. We're going to battle, but I'm just going to leave it home because I'm just I'm just that studly of a guy. And then, of course, <clears throat> what happens? They're, they get their they pee their pants and <laughs> hightail it out of there. They literally turned and ran. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I I like to make the point here of this. Yeah. So they have armor before, but this armor that Moroni made. It says that he altered the affairs of the people so dramatically that they were yeah. awestruck. And this is the first glimpse they have of Moroni, the chief captain. Yeah. When he, his first act as chief captain is to, is to protect and armor his yeah. people. And this armor was so intimidating. I, I'm thinking of a line of soldiers, the sun glinting off the metallic a, a, that armor. can be seen for miles. Yeah. And the Lamanites looking at that going, um, Holy. I'm in a lambskin. <laughs> I don't want to fight today. I mean, it's like they'd seen a spaceship. They'd never seen anything like it. They turn mm. and ran. That's yeah. how frightening this was. And we learn later that when they, when they came to attack the fortified cities after they failed in their first attempt, they, uh, they, went, uh, they went, went to the fortified cities, and, and it says that Moroni... It was according to Moroni's desire because he said he that he said that they would yeah. they would fear they would they would be fearful after seeing that first city and it's exactly what happened. So I believe that that's what he did with this armor too. He knew yeah. that this armor would be intimidating. It would be fearful. One of the best uh, things you fear, can do, and it's, fear and that, that's part of the reason why the United States, for example, with the with the beginning of the Iraq War, they had that what they called the shock and awe campaign. Yeah. Basically, to 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 give them such a jolt at the very beginning right. that, it, that, it, that crushed their confidence that they were going to be able to win. Because when it comes down to war and combat, whoever's the most confident is oftentimes going to be the winner yeah. because they, they believe that they can win and it, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. What is, wasn't it George Washington that said that uh, you know, the, the best way to have peace is to always be prepared for war? Yeah, and Ronald Reagan actually had the same kind of a general, yeah. general thing, you know, basically... Uh, strength through uh, or, or peace through strength. Yeah, yeah, basically is one of the. the I mean, it does go, mean you go, you know, attacking everybody, but they should know that you're well prepared. Yeah. And that's what happened with Moroni. They they yeah. came and said, "Oh my gosh, we can't even penetrate these cities at all. Like, there's yeah. nothing we can do. They they didn't even know what to do. They were completely beside yeah. themselves. Yep. Which is exactly what he wanted. Well, the, the main difference then, basically, in this particular battle from other ones, because both the Nephites and Lamanites had things like swords and scimitars and. And yeah. all that kind of stuff. The main difference was both of them had the same weaponry. The only difference was is the, Nep the Nephites had defensive, you know, armor, That's right. and the, the armor Lamanites and thick clothing. Did. Yeah, yeah. Which okay, later, so, of course, the Lamanites copy and do the same thing. Yeah. So the Lamanites were naked except for the skin, which was girded about their loins. Verse twenty-one: Exceedingly afraid of the armies of the Nephites because of their armor, notwithstanding the number being so much greater than the Nephites. So their armor was a big, big deal. Now, I, I love this. Now, now, Moroni basically plans an ambush, <laughs> okay? And uh, I, I find it interesting because it, it, he actually, Mormon goes into this in such depth that we actually know um, that, that Moroni was actually questioning whether an ambush would be really a proper thing to do to some extent because he basically says that, um, uh, he, sa he said that, uh, this is in verse 30, he says, and also knowing... It was only the desire of the Nephites to preserve their lands and their liberty and their church. Therefore, he thought it no sin that he should defend them by stratagem, by using strategies. Uh, so Which is so having an organized yeah. plan 
it sounds like that Moroni was kind of questioning whether or not it would be okay with God if you organized to basically take down your enemy. And yeah. he basically said, he came to the conclusion that it's not a sin to do that. So it's, it's not a bad thing to take down and organize, or to organize in order to take down an enemy who is who is desperately trying to kill you and, and, and destroy your who civilization. Who only wants blood, exactly. That's, that's, that's right. their motive. And so he basically started to send things that kind of sneaky things, like spies. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's interesting that he sends spies. But one of the things I really love about this is actually in uh, verse um, 2023. 20, so Moroni sent spies, but he did something else that I think is, is, is critical. Brothers and sisters, he said that, uh, and, and Moroni also knowing of the prophecies of Alma, who was the prophet at the time, um, sent certain men unto him, desiring him that he should inquire of the Lord whether the armies of the Nephites should go to defend themselves. So it wasn't just that he was a great tactical you know, commander, but he also wanted to have, I think he wanted to have the blessing of Alma and the guidance from the Lord. Because he knew if he had if he had the Lord's prophet and the Lord behind this campaign, he was a lot more likely to be successful than if he was just doing it alone. How wonderful would it be if our military and uh, so forth would consult with our prophets or the prophet before going out and doing stuff? That would be a a different world. <laughs> it would be a different world, and there wouldn't be any uh, any any proactive or pre, uh, it's, it's, pre it's, it is interesting to note yeah. that uh, the, you know the, that's wars. why the, the constitution yeah. you know is there to you know declare war as an act of congress it's it's the protections are all there they try to they try to insulate us but uh yeah kind of do our own yeah. own thing seems like these days yep and uh, so he said, so so he, he he got the instructions from Alma. Alma basically said, uh, I prayed to the, to the Lord, and the Lord basically showed me that the Lamanites are going to come down around this this area, around uh, down through Manti area. Um, so now, with that little bit of intelligence, now Moroni basically creates a plan. He sets a right. trap for him, actually. And so they and, and they know that they're going to cross in this particular He's very area. Proactive. Yes. Yes. He didn't just you know okay well he really. Yeah, he did the plan. Yeah, so so this is the, this is an interesting plan. One of my one of my favorite examples here using the River Sidon. So they decided to kind of use the River Sidon here, um, and and apparently, uh, brothers and sisters, the River Sidon had to have been a, a a big river. How do we know that? Because the the Lamanites, the Nephites, seemed to know right where they were going to cross. And uh, and to, to get over to Manti, they basically had to cross the River Sidon. And apparently you couldn't cross anywhere up along the, the river. You had to, there was a particular place where they were going to cross. And so Moroni sets up his army. He has uh, his, his captain, one of his captains by the name of Lehi. He sets up on the east side of the river. And then, uh, and then south of the, this, this hill called um, Ripla, I think it was, the hill yeah, Ripla. Hill Ripla. Mm -hmm. And then the Lamanites come down and they basically, they go on the north side of the, of the, of the hill. So they don't see the armies. They go past the armies. Of, uh, of of Moroni, and they're heading over to the river crossing, so they can get over to Manti. And as soon as they get past the army, then all of a sudden, you know, Lehi and his people basically they come in behind them, jump them from behind. They jump them from behind, so they they obviously they were going west because they come in you know, the the back the back end would have been on the east side of the the Lamanite sure. army going this way. They came in on the back side, came in behind them, and basically. They they started to fight and uh, and it wasn't going too well for the Lamanites. They said that what was the the, the, the term that they said here? The um, let's see, this is the Battle of Ripla. This is verse thirty four. It came to pass that the Lamanites came up on the north of the hill with with a part of the army, and and uh, verse thirty five. And as the Lamanites had passed the hill Ripla and came into the valley and began to cross the river Sidon, the army which was concealed on the south of the hill, which was led by the man whose name was Lehi. And he led his army forth and encircled the Lamanites about on the east in their rear. So he's on the, the, on the east side in the back of them. And it came to pass that the Lamanites, when they saw the Nephites coming upon them in their rear, they turned upon them and began to contend with the army of Lehi. And the work of death commenced on both sides, but it was more dreadful on the part of the Lamanites, for their nakedness was exposed to the heavy blows of the Nephites with their swords and their scimitars, 
which brought death almost at every stroke. So basically, the Nephites were just having their way, basically, with these with these Lamanite warriors. What the Lamanite warriors yeah. feared when they hightailed and ran away. Yeah. Is, is what so they head over to the happened. river. They said, okay, we're going to get away from here. They're going to go over to the river. Um, and again it, it, again, it mentions the breastplates and the arm shields and the head plates that the Nephites did carry they did carry on the work of death among the Lamanites. On, ver, on, on page 289 are some examples of some of these head plates and uh, breastplates that we actually have in the archaeological record of the ancient Hopewell mound builder people. These are copper ones. Uh, the breastplates were fairly large. Um, the, the, these were individual ones here that have been found, but there are others that uh, Wayne May has talked about uh, that were discovered that they were said they were completely covered with armor. Some of the uh, some of these Hopewell Mound Builder people, uh, they had their, their their whole bodies were basically covered with this armor. Now that wasn't generally the case. I think that this metal was pretty hard to come by. It wasn't readily available, and so they so it was rather rare. But but yet some of them, probably the frontline soldiers, would have had the most armor, I would guess, and the ones behind that maybe had somewhat less. But uh, but here you can see that now. I, one one of the arguments I've had uh, people um, say was well. But these are pretty thin. I mean, they, they wouldn't they wouldn't stop a sword. They wouldn't stop a, an arrow, and um, and that may be true. But it would be better than nothing. But actually, it, it talks about this that uh, that that um, they get to the point where the Lamanites now they they get in the river. They cross over the river. They're thinking, okay, they're going to get away from the the, the the Nephites on the east side. Uh, the Lehi and his men basically take up that the, the the east bank of the river Sidon, and so the Lamanites are now all crossing over the river over to the west side, and uh, and what they find over there were Moroni in verse 27. The Moroni had caused that his army should be secreted in the valley which was near the bank of the river Sidon, which was on the west of the river Sidon, in the wilderness, and that's from uh, verse 27. And then, uh, so, so then in verse 40, it says, They were pursued by Lehi and his men and were driven by Lehi into the waters of Sidon. And they crossed the waters of Sidon. And Lehi retained his armies on the bank of the river on that side. It came to pass that Moroni and his army met the Lamanites in the valley on the other side of the river and began to fall upon them to slay them. And the Lamanites did flee again before them towards the land of Manti. Now, this is where the, uh, the, the Lamanites realize that now they're, they're trapped. They're trapped in the river. Basically, they got the Nephite army on the east side. They're being pushed up against the river on the west side. And now they, they realize we're in trouble. So they said they fought like dragons. <laughs> Wait a minute, dragons? Dragons. Yeah, it, it said, yeah, it's dragons. Yep. Wonder what that means. I mean, did the Nephites know what dragons were? Obviously. Apparently, they must have known something about dragons because they said they fought like dragons and many of the Nephites were slain by their hands. They, and they did, and this is, I find this interesting, they did smite in two many of the head plates and they did pierce many of the breast plates. So even though they were metal, they actually did pierce them. If they got a direct shot on it, they actually could split the head plates. Now, and, and, and now okay, I, I'm going to show you some of the armor that I had uh, I, I didn't have it made. Actually, it was given to me by a guy who actually did it for the, for the uh, the new um, temple, or Gilbert, the Gilbert Temple in in, uh, in Arizona, and they had a big youth celebration. And so they asked him to make Nephite armor because they're going to have Moroni come riding in on this horse, with a with a title of Liberty. And in fact, maybe we can show you just a little uh, excerpt of that here, um, in in the in the podcast here. <laughs> So they, they said, "Would you make a, a set of armor?" And uh, and my friend uh, basically said, "Yes, I, I can. I can make this armor." 
Uh, but he said, but I, I have one condition. He said, what's that? He said, I want to make it like the actual armor of the Nephites. He said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, I want to make it like the Hopewell Mound Builder people armor. So he consulted with me and Wayne May and so forth, and he made a set of armor. And uh, so this is, I'm going to show you, so we've got some of the pieces here. And uh, so this is the, 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 a belt here that basically goes around and it would protect the, the hips, basically, the, the hip area there. And uh, so if you know, uh, can't, can't get your leg cut off as easily with that. <laughs> um, and then this is what, when I, I put this on Alex Boya here <laughs> earlier on in the podcast. But this is the armor that he made for that. And... Uh, let me see here. His name is, is Jody White. He, he made this stuff and uh, from Arizona. So shout out to Jody. Jody, glad to thank you for making this awesome armor here. But basically, so these are actual um, based on the on the archaeological findings of the Hopewell Mound Builder people. So for example, a lot of them did have, in fact, breastplates. Now we we put a little uh, a little you know design on here to make it look kind of cool, but basically they had breastplates they had uh these these uh, shoulder shields right here they had arm shields which are talked about here um also in the book of mormon here and uh, so they could protect their arms and then they also had and back here if i can get back over to this one right here is a a, a, a head plate and we know that, uh, that some of the Hopewell Mound Builder people actually not only did they have this this copper head plate here, but uh, that they had these these copper shields that went along the side of their face, basically kind of shielding their their jawline, if you will. Um, occasionally, would find some of these, and they also had pearls. Uh, in the Book of Mormon, they talked about having fine pearls, and, had, and they've actually found pearls on these headdresses and these these things in this in, in this general area, like we see here, actually archaeologically. Uh, done. So this is actually um, as accurate as we know. I mean, we obviously don't have pictures of the actual, you know, ones that they were wearing, but these were based off of the ones that have actually been found in the ground in the Hopewell Mound Builder culture. Of course, any feathers and that kind of thing, and the leather part of it would all be rotted away, you know, after the first, you know, few years. So, so, uh, so they had this kind of thing. Um, these are this is archaeologically, um, you know, kind of. Uh, correct there but there could have been a lot of other stuff for example we, we know that they had sometimes they had a, a, a breastplate here and another one that came down here well i have a down here i have that pulled up yeah so let's take a look so at this is from the ohio democrat in new philadelphia ohio yes uh, at a depth of 14 feet so burial mound in north fork at the depth of 14 feet near the center of the mound, they exhumed a, the massive skeleton of a man, Captain Moroni. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> no, of a man, which was. Now, you have, pay attention to the wording here and look these words up. Which was encased, encased in copper armor. When you encase something, that's, that's, that's a, lot. That's a yeah. lot of armor. The head was covered with an oval shaped cap. Uh, the jaws had copper moldings. Okay, so I'm thinking a custom mold jaw plate. Yeah. Right. Like, like, kind of like the uh, the Roman soldiers had. Yeah, it mean, could yeah. could be. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I envisioned it being separate, like you have. Yeah. It's a cop. It's a jaw jaw molding, right? Molding meaning yeah. molded, right? Yeah. Uh, so that also it it, it it alludes to a great precision yeah. of this armor. Yeah. And then and the arms were dressed in copper dressed in copper copper plates but covered wait, 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 before you go too far <laughs> on that i want you to finish that up okay. but and on page 290 if you have the annotated book of mormon here you can see their arms these yeah. are arm shields these are actual arm shields yep. that have been that have been uh recovered in archaeological sites dressed and, and this in one copper. right here yep. um this one is awesome this is my friend uh, dr uh, erickson has this uh has, has this actual artifact it was dug up in a road uh, construction project in Ohio, probably about 25 years ago, and uh, anyway, and long story short, is he ended up with it. But this thing is is a, it's a it's a copper um, arm shield, yeah. and and Darren just so I, I wish I, I wish I 
would have gotten it. <laughs> I well, I wish I would have brought because our armor that we made has one. Has too. that too? Yeah. But I mean, it's it's probably about that big around. Yeah. And if I put it on my my arm here, okay, it's a little loose. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah you yeah. take a look at that arm, and uh, here, come on, come on, bring it up. <laughs> I mean, it literally it would it would probably almost fit your arm. It might be your arm might be just a little bit bigger than that, but probably I would guess that your diet and your Thank life you. has been Thank way better you. than an average knee fight. <laughs> I'm not quite sure about that. <laughs> they, they had a lot of natural foods back then. They did. Our, our they diets did. today kill us. That's a whole yeah, other thing. We're going to talk about that too in this, in this <laughs> because that's also talked about the, the, the plants and the seasons of the years talking right. about in these, in these things. But the bottom line is that was an actual artifact and it would barely fit your arms. I'm not sure if it would actually fit around your arms or not, but that gives you kind of an idea of the sheer just size of yeah. some of these guys. These were not. Wimpy, not, you know, not, uh, small not, guys. As they say the the toys, little people. Yeah, these, <laughs> these these are warriors. Yeah, these are warrior people here. All right, so they fought like dragons. They they the, the head plates and breastplates. You want to show them this and, and your yeah right yeah. Here. So okay, so, so just finishing this, it yeah. says copper plates. Okay, plural plates yeah. covered the chest and stomach. Yeah. Okay, and the mouth was stuffed with genuine pearls. Of immense size so whoever this was buried was a an honored warrior like I mean they yeah. stuffed his mouth with these gigantic pearls yeah to signify how important you know they they felt this person was yeah. so so this this By breastplate way, if you want to wonder about the pearls where they get the pearls from if they're up in Ohio or in or in around Zarahemla around Illinois or, or yeah. Missouri area they actually had cultured pearls folks they were actually culturing freshwater pearls, and and we know that because some of them had as many as twenty thousand pearls that were with single burials hmm. in like the site mound in Ohio. So uh, they had they had pearls. It's incredible, yeah. It's awesome. So when we when we did our armor, of course, uh, uh, I took that a, a plate that covers the chest, plate that covers the stomach, plates plural. Yeah. Plates. So this, you know, we, this is a combination of engineering and how would that work? And you know, if I'm leaning forward, leaning back, <laughs> yeah. I think I'm leaning back. I'm leaning forward. You need the flexibility. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they would have been running around like knights in shining armor like this. Yeah. They had to be move, move and agile. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're fighting people without armor who can move a lot faster. Yeah. And so your anyway, quickness in battle, hand to hand combat. Your quickness is one of the primary things that you've got to be. Right, cognizant of. Right, so that's that was our that was our breastplate, slightly different, but of course it's for a movie too. So. Yeah, but that, you got you got to show them this. This is just cool. <laughs> so yeah, this is uh, let me grab this. This is a uh, our helmet, and uh, you know we have gotten some criticism. You know, by the way, you're always going to be criticized when you make a movie. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we've had some criticism. Well, that looks too Roman. But, you know, they don't quite see that we've actually, this plate is is uh, independent of this plate. There's two they're, separate they're, plates. This is a head plate. They're joined together by a hardened piece of arm or, or, arm, or leather. leather, Yeah. much like you've got there. So when I think of a copper molding jaw, right, yeah. this was molded to my jaw. Like literally, I was made. They made a, a mannequin of my face at, in FBFX. They're the same people that made Troy's armor and Gladiator, yeah. and uh, and they they molded this to my head. And yeah. so, this of course would be uh, the head plate, which you know making sense that it goes back here, and yeah. this giving it a little bit of an Egyptian feel. That obviously, they yeah. talked constantly of Joseph of Egypt. He had an immense yeah. uh, influence on their society. And uh, so we had a little G Egyptian influence, and here was meant to simulate pearls, uh, but they they made them more like metal grommets. But that was the, that was the idea is that <laughs> these, were, these were going to be yeah, because there there are actual there. actual head plates that have the, those jaw plates that have right. the pearls actually embedded in them. right the one yeah. in your book there yeah has it on there. exactly yeah so you had that that had that made and uh, it's, it's got a very very much coolness factor. <laughs> <laughs> well, you make it a movie. It's like when they made Gladiator. They said the Colosseum's too small, so they made it bigger. And the same yeah. thing with Troy. You know, the ruins are like this doesn't look big enough, so they made it huge. It's, it's, it's a movie. It's you know. Yeah, no, they also had swords. So you got to show them your sword real quick here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I don't know if we'd make it exactly the same twice, but uh, you know, we had this symbol, which was Moroni's symbol, 
uh, that, that we, uh, you know, created. Um, and this is uh, essentially Moroni in Hebrew oh, there. Oh, cool. So you can see it's pretty chewed up. <laughs> yeah, it's been we chewed used up. it on set, so <laughs> you see those those rivets in there. Actual, Unfortunately, uh, in, in movie props, they're not always, you know, battle ready, if you will. So. <laughs> yeah. But they look cool. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, we had those uh, custom made and yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Finally, the great Moroni. Tell me, free man, does the last of the Nephite blood still cry out to a god who left him alone to die? Deny him! End this frivolous struggle! The exile wishes to say so. If you like this Come Follow Me supplemental study, click the like button and share it with your friends. You can also send your family and friends to bookofmormonevidence.org, which is a hub with all the links that you would like to the podcasts, to upcoming events, the store, at the 400 answers to the Book of Mormon. Also, don't forget, this summer you can have a spiritual boost every day by going to bookofmormonevidencestreaming.com.